who is calling the shots in the SLPP? I mean, you are still chairman, you say, but yeah. then who is calling the shots? Is it an individual or is it uh, no, well, the fran actual? Well, frankly, it's an invisible hand that controls everything, right? But today you have the majority of SLPP members controlled by a force outside parliament who is not accountable to anybody under the sun. Mm. Right? So we represent the parties of SLPP. Not the people who are trying to tie the SLPP to the UNP as some kind of tail of the UNP. That is not SLPP. Where is the alternative? The alternative does not consist of personalities. Is it really a policy decision that uh, uh, resulted in you all moving out or was it because you all were not given positions uh, in the we cabinet? Could, we could have had any positions we wanted. Well, welcome to another episode of On Fire here on Daily Mirror. I'm Iswaran Ratnam. The political arena has been very active these days. Uh, taking highlight, of course, was uh, uh, the defection uh, of a group of uh, SLPP MPs uh, who uh, crossed over to the opposition benches and are sitting as independent members of parliament. Um, with me is uh, Professor G.L. Piris, uh, who is a key member in that uh, group that uh, crossed over to the opposition ventures. Uh, firstly, mm -hmm. welcome to the program. Uh, thank you. Thank Pires. you very much. Thank you. Um, so briefly, what made you and the 13 MPs cross over to the opposition? Yes. Well, first of all, I'm not sure that the word defection is appropriate because we made it very clear <clears throat> that we continue as a group, an independent group within the SLPP. But we will sit in opposition. Now, our contention very consistently is that we represent the identity and the policy of the SLPP. Now, that can be clearly shown by uh, scrutinizing the manifesto of the SLPP, its constitution, and more particularly, everything that we said from political platforms up and down the country, uh, particularly during the lead up to the parliamentary elections of August 2020. Uh, the Honorable Mahinda Rajapaksa as the leader of the party and I as chairman of the party appeared on each of those major platforms in every district of the country. And we place before the people a very clear program of work. This is our objective and this is how we propose to reach that objective. So it was an agenda, a substantive agenda, for which we asked for the support of the people. And we received that in resounding measure. Uh, <clears throat> 143 members out of 225 were returned to the Sri Lankan parliament on the SLPP ticket. What for? To implement the program that we agreed with the people, the social contract between the voters and the uh, parliamentarians that are elected by the voters. Now, what happened next? What was done in parliament was a complete distortion, I would say an absolute reversal of the solemn pledges that we gave to the people. So here you have the mandate being turned upside down. That is no exaggeration. We ended up supporting the candidate of the party against whom we campaigned very vigorously with all the vehemence at our command during these elections. Right? So we let down the people of the country in general and the SLPP, the port to our supporters in particular. Now they have nowhere to go. What do we do? The party that ought to represent them has betrayed them. In that situation, we felt that there is a huge lacuna, a gap in the political system and there really does need to be uh, a 
a force, a platform to accommodate the aspirations of the SLPP supporters. That is what we are trying to do. So we represent the parties of SLPP, not the people who are trying to tie the SLPP to the UNP as some kind of tail of the UNP. That is not SLPP. So it is not a defection. It is an assertion of the ideology, the values of the SLPP and that is what we have set out to do. But as SLPP chairman, are you still attending uh, party meetings? No, 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 no because that, that, that is uh, a small group of people who have taken over the party. Uh, it's a kind of But cover. that's a very, uh, very uh, strong uh, group of people, right? I mean, it has uh, Basil Rajapaksha, Mahindra Rajapaksha, Nama Rajapaksha, the key players in that party yeah. are still part yeah. of that. Yeah, but in this day and age, is that how you constitute the political the names that you mentioned? Yes. Right? Uh, I mean, are political parties uh, organized on that basis? I mean, we are not living in the Middle Ages, we yeah. are living in the 21st century. So, a party must have popular appeal. You see, they are not uh, living in feudal times. No? So, th that uh, is, is a very significant issue that needs to be grappled with in a spirit of uh, candor. I mean, you have uh, decisions being made by a very small group of people. And whether that reflects the aspirations of the vast mass of the party is uh, very questionable. The, do you have the support? Uh, I mean, you said that you you uh, moved out in order to uh, uh, ensure that the policies of the SLPP are continued and that uh, the people's expectations in the SLPP are continued as well. But does this group have the support of the people uh, yeah. in numbers at least? Well, <clears throat> definitely, you know, we, we spent three days in Anuradhapura and uh, a cross section of people right across the social spectrum met us, uh, particularly professionals. You see, our group of uh, 13 people consists of uh, university professors, PhD holders, uh, members of the legal profession, doctors, and so on, right? So, we were greatly encouraged by the response of the professionals, academics and so on in Amradhapura, business people and the grassroots politicians from the Pradesh Sabhas and so on. Uh, we visited uh, religious leaders and I can say this is uh, the beginning of the journey, but the response so far is very, very positive and enthusiastic for the reason that I gave earlier. There, there, there is a, uh, a yawning gap which needs to be filled. I mean, you know, in Anuradhapura, we saw every roundabout was decorated, right? So, half the flags are UNP flags and half the flag flags are SLPP flags. Now, is that what we told the people during the presidential election of November 2019 and the parliamentary election of August 2020? Did we say that we will team up with the UNP and we will organize ourselves together, half the flags there, half the flags here? Uh, if, if we had told the people that can we, in the wildest of our dreams, would we expect this result? Then is it fair by the people to get their votes on a false premise? Uh, and then uh, to do the precise opposite of what we said we would do. I think it is unique in the annals of political history at any time in any country. Now, the election that took place uh, in parliament, the presidential election on the uh, 20th of July, this year. Hmm. Admittedly, it is legal in terms of Article 40 of the Constitution. But what happened? Uh, about 101 members of the Porto SLPP voted for the UNP leader. Right? Now, uh, the UNP leader is somebody whose uh, strengths I recognize. He was uh, my student in the uh, Faculty of Law, so I know <coughs> what his uh, strengths are. But the fact remains that the people rejected him, even his own constituency rejected him, right? Then he wasn't able to get one single member elected on his party ticket from any part of the country. Now, you will have to admit, now I'm not being personally acrimonious at all, I respect him. And, but uh, the, it, it is a fact that that was a fate that did not befall any political leader in our country at any time. Mm. Political leaders have been defeated, but nobody has been reduced to zero and been sent out of parliament. Right? But having said that, Professor, mm -hmm. Mahindra Rajapaksha, Gotabe Rajapaksha are also now being, to some extent, being rejected uh, by the people. Um, so then, where is the alternative? 
the alternative does not consist of personalities, right? The alternative consists of ideas, of policies, of freshness, a new departure, right? And um, the Aragalaya had a visionary aspect to it, right? Later, it, resort, it uh, degenerated into violence. That is not to be condoned uh, in any manner whatsoever. But uh, there was a kind of renaissance feeling about it, you know, the, uh, uh, the work that was produced by these people, dramas, paintings, sculpture and so on. It, it was an expression of creativity and a deep desire for a system change, to reorganize the system. Hmm? Now, have we done that? Now, uh, in, in the next few days, you will have a jumbo cabinet, okay? You will have 40 state ministers, 30 cabinet ministers, then I don't know, it could even go beyond that under the rubric of a national government, right? Uh, now, is that a sensitive response to the needs of our people at that time? I, I would say it is absolutely unfeeling and callous. So you right? don't agree with this idea of uh, a national government? No, it all depends on what you mean by a national government. Up to date, there has not been one word spoken about a common policy, a common program. That is what is important about uh, national government, right? Everybody getting together and uh, agreeing on a set of substantive policies in health, in education, in agriculture, with regard to the economy is stable over a reasonable time frame. That is not the emphasis at all. The emphasis is very simply on dividing the lobes among the fishers, right? Uh, cars, uh, personal staffs, travel, allowances, salaries. That is why there is such a scuffle uh, for these positions. And that is why cabinet formation, the appointment of state ministers is being uh, delayed uh, week by week. You can't, there, 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 there is such a tug of war for it. Hmm? All in a situation where uh, seven families out of ten have great difficulty in having two square meals a day and the child malnutrition we are the second highest in the in asia in all of asia and we are the fifth highest in the world right food price in inflation is between 85 and 90 percent right in that situation our emphasis is on creating more and more ministers more and more uh, state ministers so what are our priorities then you know, the, the fact of the matter is that the government today is an intolerable burden on the people. We have no dollars, we have no rupees. So whatever scarce resources we have must be utilized to support the people, to provide them with their meals, food, medicines, fuel. What are we doing? We are compelling the public to support us, right? That is absolutely callous, right? The ultimate of insensitivity. And you must expect a public reaction. I mean, if you place yourself in the shoes of a family that is struggling to survive, right? You watch uh, television uh, in the evening, you, you have the comments of people uh, that it is absolutely impossible to make ends meet. Now you tell them that you are creating uh, 70 ministers with all the expenses that that entails. What kind of reaction do you expect? Do you think people are going to be happy? Are they going to be jubilant about it? Will there not be social discontent? Then what the is the answer? People seem to be satisfied with the fuel that is being given now, with the gas that's coming in. We don't see the sort of protests that we saw earlier. No, but so, okay. The QR code is, we have to admit, a limited success in the sense, if, if, you, if you judge it by the uh, optics of uh, queues, right? There, there is certainly an improvement. There's no doubt about it. But what has the QR code actually done? It has forced you and me and all of us to get, a, get accustomed to a new norm. Okay, that's timely. The country needs it. But there's no denying the fact that the country is managing with less than 50% of the fuel that we had earlier. Mm. So you and I can cut down our travel. That's not a problem. But what about industrial production, uh, which contributes to GDP? So factories are closing down. They are... They are reducing the extent of their operations so industrial activity is shrinking with that comes retrenchment now just focus for a moment on the ban of uh, imports ban of imports the hs code right mm -hmm. that has been done in a completely indiscriminate manner inputs that are required for industry right the printing industry the apparel sector ball bearings air compressors 
right? Uh, offset uh, printing machines. Uh, uh, all of these things have been banned. Now, th that, that is going to impact on our exports, on, on our tourism sector. Uh, the small and medium sector is going to take a huge beating. Then small garages, uh, you know, small establishments that re repair laptops or computers or even mobile phones, all of that will go out of business, right? The tea industry will be affected, the rice industry, right? Uh, so, uh, two things are happening at the same time. One is the cost of living is going literally through the roof. Mm. That has not hit our people yet because they haven't still begun to get their enhanced electricity bills, water bills and so on, right? Now, VAT has gone, people think it has gone from 12 to 15 percent. But today in parliament, the government uh, introduced uh, the uh, social security contribution levy. That is four and a half percent. So, and that's a cascading tax, mind you. So, VAT goes up not from 12 to 15, but from 12 to 19 or 20 percent. Now, imagine what, what that would do to ordinary people, right? Uh, so, that's where we are. You, you, you have the cost of living increasing, livelihoods shrinking collapsing, employment. So, those are the twin aspects of the crisis. Who is calling the shots in the SLPP? I mean, you are still chairman, you say, but yeah. then who is calling the shots? Is it an individual or is it uh, no, well, the actual? Fr frankly, it's an invisible hand that controls everything, right? Now, there is so much feeling in the country about the excessive powers attaching to the executive presidency. People are saying it's too powerful. It has a chilling effect on other institutions. But don't forget that the executive presidency operates within the framework of the law, right? In terms of Article 33A, which was introduced into the Constitution by Section 6 of the 19th Amendment, the president is responsible to parliament for the proper discharge of his uh, functions and responsibilities, right? But today you have the majority of SLPP members controlled by a force outside parliament who is not accountable to anybody under the sun. Right? So, if you object to the uh, all-encompassing powers of the presidency, which is accountable, it is a legal institution, it is an in integral part of the constitution, how much more should one object to an invisible hand, not accountable to anybody on earth, right? who is effectively controlling parliament? Because the president, powerful as he <coughs> is, has only one member of parliament, the Honorable Vajir so, the president is necessarily reliant on the SLPP. The SLPP can pull the rug from, from under his feet at any time, right? So, it is a unique situation in any legislature in any part of the world. You, you have a president, but the president is entirely and totally dependent on the SLPP, which is a different political entity with a different political ideology and different entirely divergent priorities, right? So, who then becomes uh, the power behind the throne? The SLPP. Who controls the SLPP? Everybody knows the answer to that question. So, this person uh, never had any discussions with you uh, or this group? No, there's no the discussion. The discussion, <coughs> discussion is far removed from the prevailing culture. Um, is it really a policy decision that uh, uh, resulted in you all moving out or was it because you all were not given positions uh, in the we cabinet? Could, we could have had any positions we wanted, right? There was absolutely no problem about it. But our position was we will not take positions, salaries, uh, allowances, other emoluments because it is not fair by the people at this time. That is not what is required. So, we said a positive and unequivocal no to positions. We could have had them for the mere asking. They were on offer, on a platter. We said no. That does not mean that we are dissociating ourselves from this entire exercise. We will contribute in the manner that a contribution is required. Into policy formulation. And you uh, met uh, the president as well, right? Your yes, group had we, discussions with no, the we, we, we met the honorable president and we conveyed that message to him in very clear terms. We will cooperate in committees of parliament to, to do with coming up with ideas, perspectives, right? But not material benefits as cabinet or state ministers. That has been a consistent position and that is the right position, right? But this is, uh, this is just a fight for portfolios, everybody uh, making their claims. Uh, it's all right in a situation of prosperity, but uh, our people have never suffered as much as they are doing now and there is a limit to human endurance. 
right? And we are fast reaching that limit. In that situation, to create 70 ministers is, my, in my opinion, is absolutely unpardonable. And it is, uh, I think the word is not too strong, it is a betrayal, it is, it is uh, treacherous. And it is uh, a, a total uh, reversal of healthy and pragmatic uh, priorities. Now, you all have formed a new uh, um, political party. No, we haven't said. formed a party. No, I want to correct you on that. It is not a party. It is a broad platform. It is a movement, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, we are trying to gather people around us. There is already, as I said, a very strong and spontaneous response because there, there is a feeling that this is needed. And there are many things that people uh, admire uh, about our membership. Uh, one is, is the fact that they are all educated people. Now, there is a clamor that educated people must be in parliament, not people who have not even passed a GC O level, right? So that is one. The other is that there really is a very strong desire for financial uh, probity and rectitude, integrity. Now, among our members, there isn't a single person against whom there are allegations of corruption. Okay. Now, even the IMF uh, staff level agreement, uh, I think this waste and extravagance is going to be a major impediment. The IMF is not giving money to create more ministers and to look after them. Then the other issue is corruption. Uh, now take the black sands issue, all I am prepared to say uh, is that there are many features of that transaction which bear intense scrutiny, very important. Now there is litigation, the matter has been taken to the Supreme Court on a fundamental rights uh, application. right? So I, I think the courts are going to have to play a much more vigorous role with regard to combating corruption in this country. So if you want creditors to take haircuts, if you want multilateral institutions like the IMF, the World Bank and the ADB to come to our aid, then there must be less corruption. The IMF itself used the phrase corruption vulnerabilities. The um, uh, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of the US Senate had some very direct things to say about the scale of corruption in Sri Lanka. So we have to address those issues and therefore uh, financial integrity is important. So these are the things that people are looking for and I think there has to be a, a, a positive response to that. I just want to touch on uh, two uh, uh, aspects that involved you in the past as well as yeah. former foreign minister and as a constitutional expert. Yeah. Uh, the president seems to be uh, winning, if I may use that word, the support of uh, the international community to some extent. The US uh, has responded positively, the UK, the EU. Uh, so as far as our international relations are concerned under President Ranil Vikrama Singh, does it look like he is doing something that is uh, working in his favour? No, if he is succeeding, we are happy for the sake of the country. But I think the uh, best answer to your question would be to have a look at the uh, report of the uh, United Nations High Commissioner Human on Human Rights. Rights. We don't have to wait long. That is being presented to the Council at its 51st session, which begins next Monday on the 12th of September. So let's look at the report and see whether uh, the image that you're talking about is actually a reality or not. Uh, that 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 is expected to be a comprehensive report because the council mandated the high commissioner to come up with a comprehensive report. So that is the report that is being submitted. So let's see what their assessment is. It, is, it, is it positive? Is it good? If it is good, then uh, we can agree with you that, uh, that, that the international community is uh, looking upon us with uh, some degree of uh, respect and uh, positivism and expectation. But if the report is uh, different, mm. uh, then uh, an, a different conclusion would be appropriate. And uh, on the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution, what is your take on the proposals that have been put forward? Well, I, I think the Supreme Court has yes. just sent its determination to the Speaker. We understand, I, I haven't had the opportunity of reading it. I, I understand yes, that one or two, yes, so one or two yes. clauses are no, inconsistent in the sense that they would require to be passed by at a referendum. Of course, those uh, clauses can be amended uh, to enable a passage of the 22nd Amendment by a two-thirds majority. So, on, on the whole, it is good. It is a step in the right direction. Uh, it has flaws, 
and we propose to move some committee stage amendments to remove those uh, in, in imperfections. But uh, it is definitely our view that the 22nd amendment should, should be enacted uh, subject to the corrections that require to be made uh, in order to uh, eliminate some of the excrescences uh, which would otherwise be uh, a blemish on that legislation. Come an election, what will your movement be doing then? I mean, are you all thinking that far already? I mean, if there is an election soon, would your group be looking no, at contesting separately? No, it is much too distant a prospect <coughs> uh, to uh, reflect on and make decisions ah. about at this time. So you have to take things as they come. First things first. Uh, first things is identity policy and also a broader formation. Now, we, we have an identity of our own. That does not mean that we will try to accomplish our objectives in, in isolation. That's not possible. So, we are already talking to other groups, mm -hmm. other major. In parliament. Yes, in parliament, other major political formations uh, in order to see what there is in common, how we can work together. At the same time, always preserving our separate identity, not uh, submerging our identity in somebody else's formation. But uh, obviously, we, we have to. Uh, agree on a program which enables uh, some coordination and some collaboration given the differences. Yeah. Uh -huh. do, you, do you feel betrayed in some extent? I mean, you were a key uh, member when the yeah. SLPP was formed and now we see these, this hidden hand and these other key uh, players uh, putting you and another group outside. Do you feel betrayed by the party? No, not betrayed, but disappointed. We are not only I, I mean the whole country. I just imagine the levels of expectation that the country entertained in 2019 and 2020. It was a political tsunami, mm -hmm. right? So people expected great things. What did they get? So it is time for some soul searching to find out what went wrong and why were, th why, why were those uh, ideals, those dreams, why did they come to naught? Right. But you were in the government then, right? So, I mean, then Gotabe Rajapaksha as president was not taking decisions as president. There was somebody else who was controlling him. Yes, it, it, it was a complex situation. Well, I mean, I, I don't think there's any harm in saying the basic problem. I, I think those in power at that time would themselves agree. And obviously, things have gone wrong. Mm -hmm. There's no denying that. So, th there must be some reason why it went wrong. And the main reason was the absence of a culture of discussion and consultation. Right? Some of the decisions were taken arbitrarily, you now take the fertilizer decision. Was it taken collectively? It was opposed in cabinet. There were, you know, there were many, there, there, there were people who said, no, it can't be done like this. Right? And other decisions also, there were those who said, let's go to the IMF earlier. Then there were different views about the exchange rate using, we, we, we had after all uh, 7.3 billion rupees uh, in our reserves. So the manner in which that was spent, there were different views. It, it's not that those views were not articulated, indeed they were, but they fell on deaf ears. So there's a point beyond which given the system, you cannot assert your point of view, you can express it, you can articulate it, but it all depends on the response. So, many things went wrong, but I would say the root cause was the absence of a, a collegiate culture, a willingness to listen, a willingness to consult others, to modify one's own preconceptions in light of the contributions of others, the inputs by others. That's how governments are run. That, uh, I would say, was the uh, thing that went fundamentally wrong. Right, we'll uh, leave it at that, uh, Professor. Thank you for thank joining you. us on On Fire here on Daily Mirror. That's all the time we have for you for uh, this episode. Till next time, stay safe. Thank you very much.